uh, higher ideal, that's what I'm talking about today. You know, on, uh, on the Earth plane, I think what we're most acquainted with is the lower ideal, the very relative uh, facts of the circumstances that we're dealing with. But in spirit, in truth, we believe that there is always a higher ideal. One of the ways I think of this is that there is a, a pattern, like a spiritual prototype for each of us. And that pattern, that prototype for each of us is a pattern of perfection. Um, it is in every cell of our being, you know, which also means that God, that spirit, that truth, that wholeness is in every cell of our body temple. It's a pattern for God to express uniquely and perfectly as means, by means of each and every one of us. So in the science of mind, we like to think of ourselves, at least I certainly do, as open. I'm open to the revelation of God's good. And we also teach that God's good is infinite. There is an infinite amount of good. And so our consciousness must become an avenue through which God's good can express. And so I believe that the good expresses in our life um, as the fruit of our working consciousness, of our prayer work, of our spiritual practice, of meditating, of constantly endeavoring to uplift our consciousness, to uplift our consciousness. I think this is an all-day activity, that I'm always trying to lift my mind up. I'm always trying to lift my mind up above the ordinary level of experience, because I don't want to have the ordinary level of experiences. I want to have a higher level of experience. Um, now, prayer, we teach in Science of Mind, prayer changes our consciousness. It doesn't change God. We don't pray to actually change the conditions. What has to change always is something in me. And then once something in me has changed, and I'm keeping it changed, it can change out here in the outer world. So, so why I think it's so important now that we meditate, especially in this time that we are living in, is that meditating settles down our human personality. And I don't know about you, but my human personality has been over the river and through the woods multiple times in these last months, right? So, so if prayer is not about changing God, it's about changing me, you know, it, so I read this this week and I thought this was great. This came from a Taoism. And it said, if you're depressed, your mind is in the past. If you're anxious, your mind is in the future. And the only place you can be peaceful is right now in this present moment. And so I've been reminding myself of that again and again this week. So if I catch myself sort of tending a little to that depressive, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the past, I'm in the past. And if I start getting, oh, I'm in the future. My God, I, I can't believe how much time I spend in the past and in the future where I'm totally missing now. I'm missing what's happening right now. Wasn't it great to meditate outside? I th that, that five minutes felt like a split second to me. I just felt like we were all so connected with each other and the world and the universe. Oh my God, that was so, I've got to start to meditate more outside. That's what I realized I have to do this morning. So people, people who we know who maybe are not on the path or are on a different path, they would probably think that, you know, that we're crazy because what we like to do is we want to affirm a greater good. We, we meditate, we pray, we work on our consciousness. And, and a lot of people would look at us and say, well, what is all that? I just, I just don't get that. But, you know, there are so many different paths to God. You know, and I say there are so many paths to God because God's the only place to go. So I bless your path to God, whatever your path to God looks like. And certainly in our church, we want to bless all people's paths to God. We think all paths to God are legitimate. The important thing is you find a path and make some steps forward on your path. And, and since we're going to respect everybody else's path, please respect ours. You know, um, so there is a, a tradition in Judaism of Hasidism, Hasidism, uh, which arose in the uh, 18th century. And there was a character, a very important man, uh, uh, the Baal Shem Tov, and he was the master of the good name. Uh, and he adhered strictly, really, really strictly to Jewish law. And he expanded Jewish religious life by um, uh, focusing on the role of joy and love um, and being open to a greater revelation of God, right? Uh, so according to the Hasidic teaching, the path to God passes through our fellow human beings. So just, just that much right there, the path to God passes through our fellow human beings. 
Ah, wow, just that gives me a lot to think about, you know, and know like, okay, as I proceed in the week ahead, I want to walk with God. I want to know that that spirit is present with me and oh, that walk is going to be through my fellow human beings on the path. Uh, so this, this man, the Baal Shem Tov, was very serious in his love for God and his love for humanity. If, if others loved the Torah, it was said that he loved the people who loved the Torah. So you get a little bit of the, the bigness of, of his consciousness, you know? And so his followers asked him why the learned rabbis deemed his teachings false. And he responded with this very simple, simple little parable. He says, once a good family held a great wedding feast. So we can all imagine that easily. And they invited their families and all their friends from the village to attend and join in the merriment. And in one corner of the large home, they set up a stand for, for the musicians to play. And uh, soon the, uh, the entire house was filled with people who were celebrating uh, they were dancing and merrymaking and carrying on, and there's music and there's rejoicing. And as they're all dancing and really getting into it, a man who was completely deaf passed by the front window of the house. And he looks in, and he sees all these people who he, who he, he cannot hear the music, right? But he sees these people, and they're jumping around wildly, and they're waving their arms in the air, and they're carrying on. But he couldn't see the musicians, right? And he can't hear the music. And so he thinks to himself, he says, wow, look at all those, that commotion there. That must be a house full of madmen. Yeah, that's what it is. It's an institution for crazy people. But, and so he went on his way, unable to take part in the celebration. Why? Because he couldn't hear the music that was animating the guests at the wedding. Now, I don't know what another person is listening to in life. I hope that we're trying to listen for the still small voice, the voice of God within, the voice of love, the voice of peace. But you know, I don't. I don't know what other people are listening to. I think he should pass this practice over to the law and go about the business you know, with a calm awareness that on the inner side of life, something is taking place. You know, when something catches our attention, you know, we maybe have that first initial human response to it, but then if we can take a moment and say, okay, oh, what's a deeper look here? How can I take a deeper pass with this and have a little bit more awareness and see if there's something else taking place other than what first catches my mind? I think we all have doubt and fear, and I think that's what has to go, you know, and, and we want to replace that with faith and confidence. This is what Ernest Holmes teaches us in the Science of Mind textbook again and again. So Jesus gave this teaching that it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I love that. I say that to myself all the time. It is the Father's good pleasure to give me the kingdom. Now, what does that kingdom mean? I think that kingdom means good health and loving relationships and creative expression and enough abundance to meet our needs and beyond, and on and on and on. But God can only give us what we can receive. And in our Science of Mind textbook, Ernest Holmes says, the taking, how we receive, is mental. So I have to say to myself, I am willing, I accept, I deserve, thank you God for everything that I can do to make myself the most willing, open, receptive vessel for God's good. You know, in our textbook, in the chapter on principles of successful living, which is one of my very favorite chapters in the textbook, but if I tell the truth, my favorite chapter is probably whichever chapter I'm reading on any given day, uh, but I do love the chapters on principles of successful living. He says, we can have what we become in consciousness. Boy, that was a revelation to me. That was huge. So how do I become more in consciousness? Well, through my spiritual practice through expanding my thinking, through keeping my thinking affirmative, through meditating and praying. You know, what you say to yourself is the most important conversation you will ever participate in. Isn't that extraordinary? That what goes on in your head, that dialogue from the time you get up in the morning till the time you go to bed at night, that has more to do with your experience of life and shaping your experience and what you draw to you you know, so what you say to yourself is really important. What you think about yourself is the most important thought you will have. What you visualize for yourself, 
You know, that's what you get. And what you feel for yourself, you know, the emotions that dominate us, that is what we are going to experience more of. So what fulfills all of us is different. I get that because we're all different. So what fulfills us is different. But could you for one minute, one minute, like, like, like a little child in your life who you just love, for one minute, talk yourself up. Imagine what you would say. Like to a little child who says something negative about themselves, how would you build that little person up? You'd say, no, that's not true about you. You'd say, you're good, you're valuable, you're wonderful, you're capable. I think we have to talk to ourselves that way. You know, uh, how would you take good care of yourself for one minute? How could you visualize the life that you want? You don't have to spend all day doing these practices, but even for just one minute, how would you feel the feelings that you want to be feeling? If I could feel them for just one minute, but I'm not feeling them. Well, this is where we act as if for a little bit. And say, okay, if I could feel them for just a minute, and if I could feel them for a minute, then I can feel them for two minutes. See, that's the divine ideal, what spirit is seeking to do through each of us, I believe. You know, we could wake up right now. You know, if we tell ourselves it's going to take us another 100 years for the planet to wake up, it will take another 100 years for the planet to wake up. I don't think we have time for that, though. You know, that we could all wake up right now. Why? Because we decide to. Because we decide to. You don't have to, um, you know, it's, it's not about getting to a place where we never have any problems. That is not the science of mind teachings. I think no problems is you're dead. That's no problems, right? Um, but how we hold those problems, those experiences, is a sign of how our life is growing. Um, so I, my encouragement for us this week is I want us to take a little bit of time for us. Um, and you know what people have often said to me when I suggest this to people is they say, well, I can't till all my problems are solved. I have to get through all these things. But what I notice is there are always all these things. Have you noticed that? You know, there's always a bunch of stuff that's got to be tended to. So I want you to take time for you. Um, because if we're saying, oh, I can't till everything is in order, till all my ducks are lined up, till all my problems are solved, till my spouse is better, till my kids go to school, whatever. Uh, they won't be, you know. <laughs> there are always going to be things. Um, living a life that is always in flux, which we all are, creates opportunities. It creates projects, or as I like to call them, AFCOs, another fine growth opportunity. Um, maybe we could start with calling our problems something else, that we don't call them problems. It's just something I have to take care of. It's just a little piece of business. Maybe it's just a challenge. See, I think we're challenged to grow in life again and again and again. And I think to myself, don't we ever get to sit back? And you know, when I close my eyes and I become prayerful, what I hear is a resounding, no. No, you don't get to sit back. You don't get to hang out. Not while we're here. You know, we are here for the growth. We are here for the good. You know, we can't control all that happens in our life. I'm so sorry to say that because for controlling people, that is really bad news. Um, but, uh, but we can control what it means to us. You know, we can control what's going on inside of us. We can control our response because as within, so without. So just like you would go to the gym, uh, perhaps to get in shape, uh, there is mental and spiritual conditioning that we do so that we are spiritually in shape for what lies ahead. You know, the quality of your life is from what you consistently say and visualize and feel for yourself. So I wonder where we are consistently, in our head or are we in our heart, you know? Where is our focus primarily? So there was a study done at UC Berkeley, I thought this was really, really interesting, with chemically depressed people. Um, and it did not involve drugs. So what they would do is they would come in every day and they would have to stand in front of a mirror. Again, no drugs were involved. They would have to stand in front of a mirror for 20 minutes and smile. That's it, that's all they did. And what happened over time was their depression disappeared. I thought that was extraordinary. We need to put this out in the media right now because I know so many people who are struggling with depression on a daily basis right now. Uh, uh, so what was happened 
so let's think about what happened there. What happened was they were breaking a pattern, right? And so much of what we do, good or bad, is a pattern. It, it, and I say all the time that our habits, our habit patterns create our destiny. So when we become aware of a pattern that is not good, what we have to do is we just have to substitute a different pattern for it. So if you keep doing the same thing over and over, we're going to keep getting what we've always gotten. We know that's insanity. We don't want to do that. But if we keep putting the same feelings into our life, that also means we're going to keep feeling the same way which for many of us does not really serve us, so we recognize, geez, that's not as good as it could be. I believe there's a higher ideal available for all of us, that we could all take our life from where it is right now, and it could just go, boom, up a little more. A little more peace, a little more freedom, a little more love. Would that be such a bad thing now for us, for everyone? I don't think so. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward for a moment now, recognizing that right here, the place whereon we stand is holy ground, because God is everywhere equally present. And I know for each and every one of us that we are one with this principle, power, and presence that we call God. God is the truth of our being, God that has no opposite, God that is all there is. And as we are all connected with God, I further know that we are all connected with each other on the unseen side of life. And so I speak this word for each and every one of us today that healing is taking place in our lives, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically. We stand as open, willing, receptive vessels for the good of God, that good that is infinite. And I know that what we do with our mind and how we speak and how we visualize, all of it affirms a greater expression of life for each and every one of us. When we pass by the mirror, we smile at us, and we are raised up. So we include in our prayer family members and friends, parents and children, all of those we hold near and dear, and we affirm that God's presence is right where they are. It surrounds them, it fills them, it uplifts them, it heals them. We bless our church and all churches everywhere, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. I know we're blessed by being together, and we let our prayer today emanate out from us to touch all people everywhere in an uplifting, healing, loving manner. So with a grateful heart, I give thanks that this is the truth. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.